Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 766. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 18th, 2022. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. Before we get any further, please like this episode, share this episode, comment on this episode. The comment section is alive and well. We really appreciate you guys going there and adding your opinion, telling us what you think of the topics, because that's very important. And if you're not subscribed yet, now is your chance to click that little red rectangle and the little bell pops up. When the bell pops up, you click that and you will get instant notifications anytime there's a new show. And if you like, we also have a podcast. So while you're at the gym working out, you can listen to Kevin and George because we're healthy too. George, you're on a diet. How's that going? I'm very cranky. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, it's not fair. My wife in a week has lost eight pounds, and on Monday morning I lost six, and then I weighed myself this morning. I've lost four. I gained two pounds yesterday, and I don't know why. Life is unfair. <laughs> it's horrible. Because I'm starving. I'm starving, Kevin. Uh, we had the walk a thon on Saturday for the Family Life and Pregnancy, Fam Family Life and Pregnancy Center, mm -hmm. and we raised over six, almost $600, and a number of our viewers contributed. There's still time to contribute, but thank you so much. It was a wonderful day. Uh, maybe all that water I drank on the uh, walkathon. That was it. No, that was it. No, I don't know. <laughs> but so, uh, good things are happening. The parish life is picking up. We're doing lots of exciting things, and I'm just miserable and cranky because I'm on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jill and I in the RV are slowly headed back to Florida. Uh, we're kind of making uh, stops right here along South Carolina and Georgia. We were in Charleston, then Savannah for a night. Now we're outside of Brunswick. And then sooner or later, by the end of the week, we should be back to Webster, Florida and start the winter season. So that the travel season, uh, you know, we're kind of saying it's over. It, it's done. The 2022, it, we're looking in the rearview mirror and uh, start to plan for 2023 won't be too long now uh but there's a cold front headed in our way george i i hear it snowed in michigan and minnesota and wisconsin uh in the last couple of days and it's coming our way we need to uh prep for snow and cold and freezing weather well i think it begs the question when does it not snow in minnesota and michigan <laughs> and wisconsin july july does it stops <laughs> all right let's move on to some uh news here um justin welby is in the news he's uh, uh been traveling down under and he's been giving his opinion and I thought we could talk a little bit about his opinion. Uh, now, you're going to hear some noise in the background. Those are trucks. I'm in a truck stop rest area uh, outside of Brunswick, Georgia. That's where I, we had stopped to, to film the show. I apologize. But it gives you that, that flavor of on the road. This is the on the road flavor. George, let's talk some of uh, Justin Welby's opinions he's given. Because they kind of affect the powerless Archbishop of Canterbury that he claims to be. If you all folks remember at uh, Lambeth in July, Archbishop Welby said uh, he has no power, he has no authority, he does not seek to exercise uh, the authority that archbishops had usually been given in the past. Well, he's been in Australia and he's been having a great old time exercising that authority that he doesn't want to exercise. He was up in uh, Thursday Island. Uh, which is in the far north of Queens, Lindor, across from New Guinea. He ordained two indigenous women to the priesthood there, and and he all made some comments about the stolen generations. And he did another stop on his apology tour, the same tour he took in Af West Africa and India, apologizing for British colonial massacre in Amritsar, apologizing for the Anglican Church of Canada's treatment of First Nations people, apologizing for the slave trade in West in, in West Africa and the West Indies. And in Australia, he apologized for the church's oppression of indigenous people. As if this, what happened in Canada and residential schools happened in Australia. Well, one of the problems is, is that that didn't happen. There's been a lot of historical controversy 
about these topics and Justin Welby basically was not briefed on what really happened in Australia. And he was taken to task in a number of newspaper articles saying, Archbishop, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, okay. Then he decided to, well, let's get involved in the fight within the Anglican Church of Australia. Well, the Diocese of the Southern Cross was formed earlier this summer as a safe harbor for those Anglicans and dioceses that are unfriendly uh, to them and to God's word written. And Justin Welby, of course, got involved by picking up the cudgel and beating the Diocese of the Southern Cross and, and by extension, the Diocese of Sydney, essentially sounding the song that unity is the most important thing that Christians can have. It's far more important than truth. And by being so doctrinaire and requiring belief in things like the Bible uh, and whatnot, instead of in the Church of England as in Australia, you're being mean. So, for instance, Sydney does not have women clergy, and it, so it treats the Archbishop of Perth, uh, K. Goldsworthy, as an administrative archbishop, but they don't sort of view her the way they would a male archbishop because they don't believe in women's orders. And so Justin, of course, had to go down the line of how hurtful this is and disrespectful, as if the people in Sydney were just misogynists, that they don't like women. Yeah, and, you know, Perth recently had its Sydney, and David Old reported on this, and we ran his stories on it, where essentially she's pushing the gay agenda without being open about it. In other words, uh, she's... Uh, not responding to questions, well, please define for us what a moral life is. Uh, well, I don't know. We'll have to have a committee decide that. But meanwhile, I'll appoint partnered gays to positions and to this and that. So the stealth, not so stealthily, but they're pushing the liberal agenda in dioceses like Perth. And Justin Welby has signed up on board in support of Kay Goldsworthy and company. Oh, and another thing he decided, well, let's talk about politics back home in England. Well, if you've been following the news, the Chancellor of the Exchequer put forward a proposal to lower income taxes on those earning over 168000 a year. And, of course, the press takes that up as tax cuts for the super wealthy. Well, maybe England is a poor country, but in the United States, 168000 is not considered super wealthy. And... This and a number and the left starts going on about, oh, trickle down economics. It's it's immoral to hurt the poor by make, having the rich pay less. Well, the problem is trickle down economics works. It worked for the United States uh, every uh, with Ronald Reagan. It works when they cut the taxes and reduce spending. And what happens is a rising tide, as they say, raises all boats. So just, just well, he's ignorant of basic economics. He, he, he's, he, knows what the, he knows what the Guardian editorial page says, but he doesn't understand how the business world works. And, you know, when after the announcement that the government would make a U-turn and not institute these tax cuts, Goldman Sachs, Capital Markets, and other major international financial players downgraded Britain's debt because they said, without the tax cuts, you're not going to climb out of this economic hole you've gotten into. So, I mean, uh, and and then he got he, he waded into foreign policy. Uh, Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, uh, said she'd consider moving the British Embassy to Jerusalem. Well, of course, that set off everybody else who everybody who hates trickle-down economics usually hates israel and doesn't want to recognize that israel is a real sovereign country and you have all sorts of people saying awful things about israel and you have the cardinal archbishop of westminster saying oh this will make peace farther away justin will be saying oh we need a negotiated settlement before we do anything like this we even had uh Haig, uh i don't want to say uh, I forget his first name, uh, Alexander Haig? No, uh, Alex Haig was the U.S. Secretary of State. Douglas Haig was a field marshal. Uh, the other Haig, the bold one. Uh, 
he was a conservative party leader for a number of years in the oh, 90s okay well Haig said well we don't want to copy donald trump's foreign policy well what happened when donald it trump worked. moved the embassy to jerusalem yeah. it worked peace broke out in the middle east the palestinians had to get serious and negotiate the uh gulf states recognized saudi, saudi arabia you know set up air travel back and forth to israel something never heard of in the 1970s and 1980s uh and now where does this uh, nonsense come that israel's not entitled to call jerusalem its capital well in 1947 when is when the un decided wanted to partition in israel they decided that we'll make jerusalem a separate state a entity or city well all the arabs voted against us it britain didn't even vote for this resolution mm -hmm. and it never passed and we had the arab israeli wars and israel started off with west jerusalem as one it's half and the arabs had east jerusalem and the israelis got all of jerusalem after uh, several other wars well international law is based on the theory that as you possess under law it's your territory there's uh, no violation of international law and besides israel's not going to the embassy in Britain is not going to be in East Jerusalem. It's going to be in West Jerusalem, along with the Americans. But because the Ameri because Donald Trump moved the embassy, we have to have this knee-jerk reaction that sort of comes into this whole discredited world elite mindset, the World Economic Forum types, of whom Justin Welby is a paid-up attending member, that uh, um, the little man must be constantly put down to support the elites. Uh, it's just disappointing to see this stuff again and again and again, unnecessary forced errors by the Archbishop of Canterbury. In yeah. my humble opinion. In our, in our humble opinion uh, from the, the United States of America, which is also going through absolute economic turmoil uh, because of all the, the giveaways we did uh, since COVID and the inflation and i i went to a restaurant yesterday in savannah and i posted on my facebook uh, uh profile a picture of the, the menu and the prices and it, it's getting it's getting a little bit expensive out here in, in the united states and um th these are these are but yeah you know, hey all right well let's, let's talk about a story we talked about last week uh, as we were going to press and recording our show the news came that the uh Canterbury Cathedral had appointed a dean who was in a same-sex relationship with another man and uh, this is obviously going to make international news and we find out now that Justin kind of uh, preempted the news by contacting the archbishops around the world and said it's not my fault that uh, this person was appointed dean of Canterbury Cathedral please remember and I told you this at Lambeth I am powerless can't, it is just a way way above my pay scale to stop something like this even though I appointed a uh, gay person to lead the crown nominations committee I could, there's no way I could have foreseen this at all so Justin wrote his apology to the archbishops what's the follow-up now George well as you say um, Justin Welby after the news broke mind you he didn't preempt the news uh, but it he wrote to all the primates uh, a letter stating the Crown Nominations Committee, through the normal processes of the Church of England, have appointed uh, the former Dean of Leicester to be Dean of Canterbury. And he's a well-qualified man, and I think this is wonderful, but I had nothing to do with the appointment. And Welby went on to say that uh, Monteith lives his gay relationship life, civil partnership, in accordance with the rules of the Church of England, which requires this to be chaste. Now, Welby didn't spell out that that, but we all know what that means. Well, all of a sudden, all of some of Monteith's speeches uh, that were on uh, about uh, reforming yeah. marriage <laughs> that were on church websites have all now disappeared. The basically speeches, yes. <laughs> where he basically puts the lie to the uh, the uh, statement now do i know for certain i don't know uh, whether his relationship is chased or not but the disappearance of his past statements on this topic um friends in england write to me and say you know this fellow uh, is 
an effeminate man. Uh, he wears scarves and um, has a. Well, hold on. I a, wear scarves. A, what do you do? You know, you got to. But uh, of a, an effeminate characteristics is what. You yes, know. he. Uh, there's a. Uh, he. Uh, what am I trying to say without being mean? <laughs> he enjoys being camp in an English way. If, mm -hmm. if you remember this sh TV show, Are You Being Served? Mr. Humphreys. If you remember the actor from the Carry On movies, uh, Kenneth Williams. Uh, that is what I'm told uh, Monteith is like. So when the Africans go to Canterbury and they see this guy, they are going to explode. Well, what's happened? Welby's letter went out, and GAFCON primates are meeting this week in Kigali. And I'm told by Archbishop Ben Kwashi that when they're done with their meeting, they will issue a part of their discussions will be about this new dean. Mm -hmm. The Global South Fellowship of Anglicans uh, has been working on a statement which they released on Monday, which they utterly condemn. Uh, this statement basically saying this is uh, hypocritical uh it all this talk about mutual accountability is all a lie um i'll read part of the letter we take exception to the church of england's accommodation of a person and a same-sex union being pointed to an office of spiritual authority over the flock of god's people looking back Perhaps the rot in upholding biblical doctrine on this matter had set in with the consecration of an openly homosexual bishop in the Diocese of Westminster, Canada in 1993. The rot has since spread throughout the woodwork of the communion, and this recent appointment is foreboding because the rot is now blatantly visible in the communion's mother church under the guise of love, tolerance, and human rights. An editorial note, of course, uh, Gene Robinson was appointed uh, in New Hampshire Right. not in uh, in New Westminster, and it was 2003, not 1993. But the trajectory of what they're saying is correct. Um, the rot's been there for 20 odd years. And their conclusion, what are they going to do about it? They're going to stay in the communion. They're, they're going to stay and fight. But it's time for the, way, the old ways to end. That Justin Welby being the first among equal, the Archbishop of Canterbury, that's done. And they're going to push hard to have the primates amongst themselves put forward a leader. Justin Welby says he doesn't want to lead. Fine with them. Uh, but they are going to uh, they're going to fill that vacuum that Justin Welby says he is there, but is but at the same time Justin Welby is fully fully uh, taking advantage of. Wow. So. Well, yeah. I mean, this was going to happen. And people say, oh, you're just, that's slippery slope. Yeah, slippery mm -hmm. slope's not true. It never happens. All we're going to do here is honor Gene Robinson and his wonderful, tremendous ministry in New Hampshire by making him bishop and allowing, you know, us to, to understand that the Holy Spirit here is doing something new. And a lot of people, and I remember talking to my bishop, uh, he wasn't my bishop, he was my future bishop at the time, uh, and he said, this is it. This is going to overtake the Episcopal Church, and certainly the Western Church, and he was exactly right. And now we have it all the way to the Mother Church, the head church of the Mother Church. And here we are. We, it's it's done. What are we going to do now, George? This is the big question. And we'll have to see what, how GAFCON and the Global South not just respond on paper, but respond in action. All right, next topic. And I remember, oh, probably 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was uh, attending a sermon given by uh, Archbishop Duncan, and he talked about how an archbishop is a servant to the servants to the servants. Uh, a, <laughs> and, you know, it's the role. You, your role as a bishop is to serve the clergy. Your role as the archbishop is to serve the bishops. And then I saw this press release that there's a new person called Bishop to the Bishops. And I don't know what that is, a Bishop to the Bishops. 
is that some soup and we need to talk about this george what's a bishop to the bishop and whom is she well one of the things that justin welby's uh pre-stuffed lambeth call papers and conversations did was recommend to have a bishop to be bishop uh to basically work and help model and train people to be bishops in the global anglican world and to have a point person on the topic of the charism of episcopacy so justin welby appointed his former chaplain joe bailey wells uh currently she's the suffragan bishop uh, assist area bishop of dorking in the diocese of guildford uh, she's a pleasant woman who's vaguely evangelical she's married to sam wells who's a very liberal man and to be perfectly frank this is a non-entity appointed to a non-important job uh jobs for the boys uh in this case jobs for one of just uh justin's loyalists uh keep the bureau bureaucracy staffed and running and uh, gosh isn't this wonderful um i must admit to a personal connection here uh, as an undergraduate, I went to Duke University, and I played a sport called lacrosse. Uh, this is in the early 80s. Now, I was going to say, it wasn't recently, because, you know, 10 years ago, you don't want to be admitting this. <laughs> I played lacrosse. I never lettered, but nonetheless, I sweated blood for a long time between 3 o'clock and 5.30 on the playing fields of North uh... Carolina. Well, we had something called the Duke lacrosse scandal about 15 years after I had left college, where members of the team were accused by a woman of engaging in gang rape and all this and that. And at the time, it was politicized by left-wing members of the faculty who said that uh, these rich suburban boys who play lacrosse must be guilty because they're white men of privilege. Uh, and this, the is, the, the, of, this is the initial, the initial Me Too. Yeah. This was the first Me Too, and the accuser is a black prostitute. Mm -hmm. uh, or a black stripper who was also whatnot. Well, and Sam Wells, as the chaplain, was chaplain at the Duke University at the time, and his wife, Joe Bailey Wells, was the head of the Episcopal House of Studies at, was basically the Episcopal Campus Ministry at Duke, at Duke. And they fully came down on the side of Believe the Woman. So, I, uh, well, but let's Lost update. my respect for my alma mater Let, at that let's, time. We need to update. There was an investigation. There was a trial. They were found what? Not guilty. And in fact, the prosecutor was disbarred because he knew it was a false charge. Yeah. But he was just doing it to uh, placate the uh, liberal media and the masses. And it was entirely false. And it nearly ruined the lives of about a half a dozen dozen boys. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I wasn't one of those boys, but, uh, I have a, a tangential connection to them. And when the ministrations, the church, when you're being unjustly accused, when you are being, uh, slandered, when you're being attacked for the color of your skin, for your parents' occupation, for the sport you play, if the church is not called to be there for the least of the least, then the church is not called to be anywhere. And what I saw from the Wells couple was people who basically put wokeness ahead of truth. So I have no expectations that I'm sure she will give pleasant speeches that say nothing, that will parrot whatever line Justin Welby's putting out at the time. She really didn't do much of anything as the area bishop of Dorking. I don't know if there's anything to do as area bishop of Dorking. I don't think. But I here don't, again, I don't recall hearing the name Dorking before. Where's that? And Where's when that? and and in her little puff piece from the Anglican Communion News Service mm -hmm. uh, that talks about uh, her appointment, she basically reveals she has no clue what the job is either. Except, I don't, uh, hey, and there's nothing wrong with that because I don't know what the job is. Okay. Um, to me, bishop to bishop is a servant of the servants, and uh, well, whatever. <laughs> so well, you do in, yeah. in the mo in the modern Anglican world, too many bishops are servants of the powerful, whether it's the economically wealthy, uh, the politically important, or the privileged. Uh, meaning those whose voice you can tell who is important in society by who cannot be criticized. And those people who cannot be criticized, more often than not, 
have the support of the institutional church leadership. We certainly see that in the Church of England. We certainly see that in the Episcopal Church, where this one of the favorite buzzwords of the modern church leadership is we're engaged in prophetic ministry. Mm -hmm. We're acting like the prophets. Well, they're acting like prophets, but prophets of Baal, not prophets of the one true Lord, because they seek to reinforce the establishment, seek to reinforce those who are in power and prevent any questioning, prevent any uh, uh, independence of thought or mind or speech. Um, I, these are hard words for me, but I'm sometimes so ashamed and embarrassed uh, by the people who are called our leaders, because they certainly are not my leader, nor are they following what I believe to be God's call uh, of serving the least, of being servants of the servants. Uh, yeah. Kevin, the, I've only met a handful of bishops. I'll, I'll throw out one, Keith Ackerman, for instance, who truly is a servant of the servants of God. Sure. They're out there, no, but they, they're, they're rare. rare. They're rare because of the inability to separate yourself from the world. The scripture tells us, you know, be of the world, but not in the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, or vice versa. <laughs> and so, in, in as such, there's so many people now who try to walk that middle, middle ground, one foot in the world, one per, uh, foot of the world. And um, you can't, it can't be done. If anything, in our judo education, judo Christian education, we should learn is you can't start on the fence on this. It's your yeses have to be yeses, your noes have to be noes, and you truly have to be a disciple. You have to be a follower. And if you're not, you're going to start leading the church astray because you want the church to reflect you, even if you're walking off the path. And here we have it. And you know, in my own life and ministry, you know, I was tagged early on as a troublemaker, going back 30 years where I assisted Cy Jones in his trial. Uh, Susan, my wife's an attorney, she assisted him. She wasn't his lawyer, but she was part of a volunteer team to help him. And I did too, when he was under attack from the National Church. Um, you help those who are uh, a good lawyer uh, let's all think of Perry Mason, for instance. Uh, <laughs> he stands up for his client and seeks this client's best interests. Mm -hmm. And a good priest stands up for the people, stands up for the poor, stands up for the oppressed. He also stands up for truth. And too often, clergy stand up for comfort and uh, prestige and power. And they're not willing to make the sacrifices of being unpopular, of making career-destroying decisions uh, that are unpopular with the powerful for doing what is right. Now, I, that is not universal. There are about 700 former Episcopal clergy who did the right thing, and for it, they were nailed by Catherine Jeffrey Shore. Not all, uh, not all who wander are lost, as uh, Gandalf once said. That's right. All right, more news. Uh, hey, they have picked a new bishop elect of the Diocese of the Mid Atlantic, replacing Bishop John Guernsey, uh, one of the first generation ACNA bishops, who I flew to Uganda to tape his consecration. Uh, he was a great bishop. I don't know very much about Chris Warner, though. I'm assuming he'll be a wonderful bishop, too. He's from South Carolina. That's yeah. as Sol far as Sol my Island, goes. yeah. So cool. On to the next. We're getting old, Kevin. All these we young are. kids. Uh, oh, they're just. Oh my gosh. All right. Uh, oh, here's the here's the big one. More bishop elect news. They are calling to postpone the Diocese of Florida re-election of the election of their next bishop. Um, quick update: They elected uh, Charlie Holt. Uh, in the, the last uh, convention, and nobody liked that. Now they're having a re-election, and because things still aren't going their way, they want to uh, to postpone it, George. Yeah, the same crowd who brought the objections against Charlie Holt the first time and were successful on the technicality of throwing out his election, mm -hmm. on the issue of the changing of uh, rules for clergy voting, 
because of the COVID problems, clergy were allowed to vote electronically from off-site, and that was not uh, passed 30 days ahead of the convention as required by the uh, rules of order. So it was election was thrown out. Charlie Holt was subsequently hired by the diocese to essentially act as a vicar general for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And now the same group of people who complained about the last election are complaining it was wrong to hire Charlie Holt because that prejudices the next election uh, because uh, it's a void of an issue. Uh, you can't assume that Charlie is going to be the next bishop. We may have a change of voting patterns. And we need more time to heal from the divisions. But I thought you caused the divisions, this you group of people. Well, we need to heal from the problems we've created. Yes. And since we're still creating problems, we're not yet healed. So essentially, this is the let's get Charlie no matter what gang. And they're going to continue hitting and hitting and hitting and trying to derail the election of a biblical conservative in Florida. And we'll just see how long uh, this goes. Yeah. I... That's the last story. My goodness, George, this is going to be a short 34 minute episode. I like that. It's about time. Oh, I'm hungry, Kevin. I'm hungry. hungry. I'm hungry. hungry. I want to go have lunch. I, I got more trucks pulling up here, so I have to edit. So he's even backing up. Don't scratch my RV. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 766 of Anglican Unscripted.